Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? Good. So some uh, Oiler news, some players off the team sent out. So what we'll do, Bruce, is go down the roster, and we will look at uh, each position, and we'll answer two questions for each player. Huh? Where should he be this year? Uh, and uh, in what role, essentially? So let's start with right wing. In the running, still, uh, in in the running as of this morning, let's say, there mm -hmm. was Ty Ratty, Tobias Reeder, Jesse Puliarvi, Zach Cassian, Kyler Yamamoto, and Pontus Aberg. So the locks, Bruce, to make the team are uh, Ratty, uh, Reeder's making this team, and Puliarvi is making this team. And I say that the people in the running to make the team are Cassie and Yamamoto and Aberg. And I think it's essentially three guys, Cassie and Yamamoto and Aberg, fighting for um, uh, the one remaining spot. But if it's Yamamoto who wins, of course, uh, there's going to be consequences uh, shaking up the top end of the roster. Because So my let's start with Yamamoto. I think he should make the Oilers. And the mm -hmm. spot that he should be in, Bruce, is uh, on Leon, Dr Leon Dreisaitl's wing. Um, I'm not yet. I'm not convinced from what I've seen of Reader that he's he hasn't outplayed Yamamoto. Yamamoto looks like the better offensive player. Doesn't even look that close at this point. Um, and unless Reader really steps up, I would say Yam that's Yamamoto's job. Dreisaitl needs another player that he can work with on the attack. That player is not Milan Lucic. So. Um, there's a good chance I think it could be Kyler Yamamoto. They could they could uh, do some damage together. Well, you know, somebody agrees with you because uh, my understanding is that that exact tr combination was put together in practice today. Okay. Of uh, dry saddle between Lucic and uh, Yamamoto, and Reader got bumped down the line. Oh, I never even saw the lines. I was busy writing the posts about all the guys they were cutting, but uh, they uh, I did take in that bit about Yamamoto uh, and you know based on what we've seen so far it's pretty hard to argue that uh, uh, he's making a very very strong bid for the team and if he's on the team I mean the style of player he is to help you he's got to be in your top six right he's the Eberly of, uh, of this generation and the Eberly has to be ideally on your second line in some ways but somewhere, some place where he's playing with other skill, and he can, and he can, uh, and probably on the second power play as well, where uh, he can put his uh, his offensive game into high gear. Okay, so where should Reader be then? Well, he's on the team. Uh, he's on the penalty kill. He's an ice time guy, so he's uh, he's fighting for bottom six line. You know, with that arrangement. I'm okay, Bruce, with him actually competing with Milan Lucic for the left wing job on the second okay. line. I think that's where I would have him. And um, good point. And, or Kyra on the third line um, and Kajula on the left side and Cassian. So he's in competition both on the left and the right. Mm -hmm. And um, th the most likely person he, he would take the job away from, I guess, would be, well, I think it, Lucic. I think Reader's probably going to work better on the second line than Milan Lucic. And um, so that's that's would be my take on that. Zach that is, Cassian. That is his uh, natural side, and and he likes uh, Drysaddle. You know, they they want to try him with Drysaddle, so maybe so. Zach Cassian, um, where should he should he make the team, and where should he be? Uh yeah, I think he should make the Hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> Zach probably Hurricane somewhere, Cassian, probably somewhere in the bottom six. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had enough of them, Bruce? Uh, no, well. I, I just think of the if, well, I mean, there, there's lots of speculation about trading for a big salary coming from Carolina. If they do, they're going to have to send some money the other way. And uh, he's a logical um, logical person for that, uh, unless they want Chris Russell, you know. <laughs> I think Cassian's <laughs> redundant, uh, uh, redundant I, I'm on the roster. I'm thinking the same way. And Lucic fills that same role. They don't need two guys like that. Cassian hasn't shown anything last year he hasn't shown anything in camp so i think um he's in danger of not if he makes the team making it as a 13th forward at this point um, if he's not traded 
I'd argue Kara fills the same role. If you're looking for a big, tough power forward that's uh, going to stand up for his teammates from time to time, Kara proved he could do that last year at a third the cost of uh, of uh, Cassian. And I would say between the two of them, Kara was the better player. I and agree. Younger and improving more. So uh, even though they play different positions, so they're not in direct competition, but we've got enough of these Reader, Aberg, Chason type guys that can play both wings that they can. I mean, they're even trying Yamamoto on left wing, right? I mean, that was something they tried last night and it worked all right. So they're obviously, you know, almost we should be looking at the wings as one entity as opposed to right and left, but we'll cover them all. Good point. Aberg, I'm saying Pontus Aberg is actually uh, done fairly – He's done okay. He's he looked a little better each game he's played in the preseason. I think he has some offensive ability, but I don't see him. So I think he's in competition. If the fourth line is uh, looking for some jump, it'll be between him and Drake Drake Kajula. Those are the two people competing. I think for a uh, a wing job on the fourth line because Aberg's not in competition for a higher than that, but he could um, make. Drake Kajula expendable. Uh, he makes less money. They could trade Kajula, uh, you know, outside. Let's say Kajula is not even involved in a main trade for a defenseman. They could just trade him for a pick and um, a, in a salary dump. So Pontus Aberg, I think, is still in the running and should be in the running for that job. You? Yeah, I kind of like Aberg, but I'm not sure that the coaches do. And, you know, he, he made that that immortal sin last year of missing practice and he lost his spot forever on McDavid's swing, which he had been playing. And then he came back a couple games later and he played like a house of fire with dry soil. I think he had six points in three games. He's really got speed. He's got some talent. I don't know if the coaches like his, uh, I call it assertiveness. That's a word I keep going back to this year. And he's, uh, I think he's in deep, like, I think he's on the roster, but he kind of pencils in at the 13th forward spot and has really since the beginning of camp. They've never included him much on the rotation. I don't think he's going to make the team. Mm -hmm. um, at the center ice position, we have four guys who are kind of locks, I think, at their positions. McDavid, Dreisaitl, Stroman, Brodziak. I don't think Brodziak has shown much in uh, training camp. He's, you know, he's, uh, I don't know if he had to show much, but he certainly, to me, hasn't. Uh, McLeod, the thought of actually kind of a, I'm always like, you know, the kid line kind of guy. I, I like that idea of, of uh, having a fourth line with young, aggressive, fast skating players always. But I think that they're going to go with Brodzik because of the youth and the speed at the top of the lineup. But McLeod, Bruce, I think, um, I don't think he has actually shown enough to make himself stay and that he's best off back in junior. So um, that's what I think is going to happen. And I think it's actually the right move to send him back to junior for a year. Well, I just wrote about him in a post provocatively titled Training Camp Surprise, Ryan McLeod, the last outsider standing after Oilers cut down to five pivots. And now five pivots, most teams will start the season with five pivots on the 23-man roster, right? Because one of the three extra guys is typically a guy that's going to play center. So to get to that role in this early in his first camp is fantastic. However, uh, what doesn't show up readily on the my version of the depth chart is the fact that he's behind two guys that are playing left wing until they're needed at center in Ryan Nugent Hopkins and Jujar Kara. So he's really behind six sort of proven, uh, reasonably proven NHL centers before they get down to him. And I can't see how he's going to make inroads on that list already. And, and no matter how much I admire his game, his 200 foot game, geez, last night he was behind his own goal line in the right position over and over again. Very impressed. I was too. The way he worked with the defenseman, advancing the puck. Yeah. Always in position to take that outlet pass. He was mm -hmm. there every single time and able to make a play with it. That was really impressive. And and, and it, Strom has been strong in camp, but this has got to send a real message to Strom and Brodziak that next year it's on. Like the, they're, yeah. they're, uh, they're going to be battling for a job. And if there's a salary, <coughs> excuse me, salary that needs cutting, Strom may be on the outs. Okay, let's move over to Do you left want to wing. Talk about Cooper Marotti that they sent down today and Brad. Oh, yeah, fair enough, Cooper Marotti. Um, I think it was the right decision to send him down. 
I mm-hmm. think uh, he's going to be the top line center in Bakersfield. He's going to—I predict—he'll have some success there, and he showed enough both smarts uh, and two-way play because he was also in the right spot advancing the puck out and also in the right spot in the offensive zone a lot, making nice plays. So I think he could be kind of like um, if Yamamoto makes this team, he might actually be first call up uh, in terms of mm-hmm. a forward who could come up from Bakersfield and fit right in in a number of different roles on the Oilers because he showed, I think, some ability. It's more than just the kind of the Patolni player who I think was more like right. in terms of a, or Arco Bello. Well, I guess Arco Bello was a bit of a defensive player, but I I saw some good two-way play from Marodi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like his, uh, I like his com- compete level. I know the, that uh, some people don't like that kind of terminology, but I, I don't mind it. I mean, he was battling hard along the walls for pucks and winning his share of pucks. Very good in tight quarters. And he needs to be because he doesn't really have that first step quickness to separate. So he needs to be able to play in tight, but he does, and he does well. Man, he finds the lanes. And uh, good, smart player. He's got he's got uh, lots of stick skills. And I have high hopes for him, but I do feel that uh, some time in the AHL is uh, uh, logical for his development time, and there he's on it. It's perfect timing, really. Left wing. Obviously, RNH Lucic, who we've talked about a little bit, and, and Kara are making the team, and they all seem fairly slotted in mm-hmm. uh, in terms of where they will go. There's Kajula and Chase on. Uh, Chase on, I guess, can play either wing, and Kajula can play either wing. Kajula l- looked okay in the last game. Um, yeah, he played good. So maybe, uh, maybe in a lesser role on a fourth line, not asked to do too much except hustle, hit as chip in offensively he can be a valuable player for the orders this year there's no reason why he can't and he's he's you know he's probably at least penciled in on the fourth line there obviously and um i'm okay with that although if they were to move him out i wouldn't you know be up in arms about it yeah well he's on the b list of uh, the cassian like salary out idea if it's not cassian it could be him uh, I, the team obviously likes him. I mean, they brought him back. I think they probably overpaid by a little bit in a second contract, but uh, here he is with, you know, a two-year contract that's not that expensive. And, and uh, uh, coming off a 13-goal season, like, he's not useless. Uh, my concern is he gives back <laughs> He gives back more than he gets. You know, the old McTavish statement, you know, it's not what you get, it's what you, not what you make, it's what you leave, right? The old snooker thing. And that's Kajula's issues. If he can, if he can ever sort of lock down into being a solid defensive player, uh, that'd be great. I'd love to see more evidence of you know. He's he's he, got to do that. He too regularly just he, he just gets beaten in one on one plays. He's got to make course. defense the heart of his game. Actually, Bruce, he's got to make it his absolute fanatical concern every time he's on the ice. And he's got to be uh, Andrew Cogbian. Yeah. And the, the phrase, he's not useless, is the very de- definition of damning with faint praise. No, I don't mean I don't mean it like that. I meant to say there's some positives in this player. Like some people, some of the stuff I've been reading suggests that he is, in fact, entirely useless. Like, oh, like I don't some people are really down on the guy. I'm not one of them. I do see some positives. I just see too many, too many minuses to to outweigh those pluses. So Chase on, I I, I think he's been okay. I don't know if he's done enough to uh, earn a job, but if they move out Kajula or and or Cassian, Chase on would be a good depth player. He wouldn't be a drop that a significant drop from either of them. So uh, as a thirteenth forward, I could see him sticking around if there's a trade. I've liked the games I've seen from uh, Chase on. He's uh, uh, he's got some breadth to his game. He can play both wings. Uh, he killed penalties, uh, and he's half decent at it. Uh, not super fast, but he's got, uh, you know, he's got sort of an offensive, at least thought in his head, which is sometimes missing from some of these bottom six uh, type players. Uh, I can easily see him fitting in, and certainly if uh, they were to move out uh, uh, Cassian as one of their few veteran wingers, and uh, that's, I mean, Chase Hahn's almost a statistically a mirror image for Cassian all except the penalties. They also uh, sent down Brad Malone today and which is no surprise at all. And we don't think have to say much about that. And Scotty Upshaw, it's one of these, we hardly knew you Scotty. Uh, 
he was he was injured. He's you know if he's at that age where veteran players can get mm-hmm. banged up and uh, they just that's the end of it for them in the NHL. Yeah, that happened to Calgary with the Armory Jagger last year, a far more celebrated case. I mean, at least in Upshaw's case, it was over early, but uh, kind of disappointing. You know, a guy from Northern Alberta here, and uh, he teamed up with Brodziak on a fairly effective fourth line in St. Louis. So it wasn't a bad sort of duo to have as an option as penalty killers and and uh, checkers. But uh, whatever was wrong with him, he just never caught up. The yeah. Injury. Okay, let's go over the defensemen. I don't think we have to say much about uh, Clefbaum, Nurse, Russell, Larson, and Benning. Um, they're the the solid top five, and they're, they're going to be used in some combination. I think, I think we're we're getting a sense though that Russell is going to be on the left side this year. Mm-hmm. He's going to be uh, bottom pairing, three third uh, third defenseman, probably on the penalty kill, getting a lot of time there, and and asked to carry. I'm guessing that the, so the candidates are Evan Bouchard and Ethan Bear mm-hmm. and um, Jakob Yarabuk, um, who would be playing on his off wing. So, yep. uh, um, so let's start with Yarabuk. I would say that I, I was surprised uh, that uh, Kevin Gravel was sent down over Yarabuk. I like Gravel's game a lot better. I thought he was a uh, faster skater, sounder defensively. Um, not as obvious, not as good with a puck, but oh, safe, a safer player for a seventh defenseman. And as I said in last night's po- podcast, he, 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 Yarabek just reminded me so much of the the, the D men of darkness. Those those defensemen that were constantly getting beat and leaking scoring chances and goals again goals against in the decade of darkness. So if it was my preference, I would have kept Gravel over Yarabek. But at this point, I, I expect Yarabek. It depends if they keep eight defensemen or not. Mm-hmm. Um, or, but I, I, I think he'll make the team over bear. And, uh, though, so I, I, I see him as the seventh defenseman, though. I don't see a, a great argument for it, although I'm not necessarily against it. Maybe, maybe he just needs a little bit more time to adapt. And I, I certainly don't want to be too rash in judging. Let's see. I'd like to see him a couple more games. And here I was hoping he'd be the next coming of Nikki Nikitin. <laughs> Someone was saying, "Well, he's worse than he's he, Yoha, he's worse than Johan Ovitu." I kind of liked Johan. I wish I, Yoha, I wish too. the I choice was Johan Ovitu, not uh, Yarabek as the seventh defenseman. But maybe it's just going to take him a little while. I mean, we've only seen him in what two or three games. Oh uh, yeah, I saw so, some nice things last night, but there he's uh, he's uh, more susceptible. Uh, than I had hoped in terms of uh, his his uh, apparent lack of uh, foot speed. I was kind of expecting, when I heard puck mover, you kind of expect a guy that can move around a little bit. And he doesn't quite look that uh, uh, that speedy. That's my Nikita. Yeah. Uh, Yarabek may, Yarabek may be the check. Puck. Yeah, that's true. Yarabek may be the check word for molasses. <laughs> <laughs> what, what he did that I liked was disrupted a lot of plays before they got going. I think I probably mentioned this in the podcast. I certainly did in my post about last night's game. And uh, he uh, he was in the way a lot when uh, Winnipeg was trying to get the puck over the blue line. And, uh, you know, just good good job chipping the puck out and and, uh, and just preventing them from, from gaining the zone. So hopefully that's a strength. But uh, if he can be weed, beat wide by C.J. Seuss, I think it was, What's going to happen when <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, Johnny Goodrow, you know? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Seuss beats you down the wing. You're in trouble. <laughs> All right. Uh, Evan Bouchard, I think he should make the team and uh, on the third pairing. And I, I've been sit- against this all along. I've seen enough now of, unfortunately, the rest of the Oilers' blue line Mm -hmm. Uh, in a negative way and Bouchard in a positive way in terms of just straight out looking up the ice and making an outlet pass it's it's shocking to say this Bruce but he's probably the best player on the the best defenseman on the team right now and that says a lot about the state and that includes Oscar Clefbaum that says a lot about the state of the Oilers defense Um, with a puck on his stick the guy can make a play and he hasn't been exposed too badly on defense so in a third, very sheltered third pairing role with Chris Russell as his partner, maybe, you know, maybe that's not asking too much of this player at this time. He is 19. He's a big guy, physically big. 
Um, so I think that's what's going to happen, and unless they make a trade. What's your take? Uh, my take is it's too soon to know, uh, which, of course, I mean, obviously it's an undercurrent of this whole podcast. But in his case, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he played at Calgary when, when their real team was in China. And then he played at home against Winnipeg when they kept all their big guns back in Winnipeg and they sent in their B team, kind of like what Edmonton did last night, right? And so we didn't see him defending against uh, against um, Wheeler or, or Scheife <laughs> or Lyon. Did he play Vancouver? Uh, I thought he, he played in, I thought he played Calgary, but the games are already running together a little bit. Uh, anyway, for uh, uh, I want to see how he does without the puck against, uh, you know, a fully representative NHL team. Uh, what I will say, though, is I, I'm, you hear in some places that, you know, the Oilers would be crazy to rush him and they've got, you know, just like their 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 history of rushing young players has uh, preceded them. But they've almost never done it with defensemen, right? Paul Coffey was the last teenage defenseman to make the Oilers. So it would be beating the odds. Uh what I would say about Bouchard is that the uh, the positives and the negatives are both big, and if the positives outweigh the negatives, uh, you got. I mean, you got to expect there's going to be mistakes and problems and goals against. I mean, that comes with the territory. But can he make up for those? I mean, we used to ask those same questions about Paul Coffey, right? Yes. It took him a couple of years before that became a big, big plus, but uh, he. Uh, uh, he developed fast, and he, you know, he was he hit the ground skating, the ice so, skating. Paul Coffey, I think, was right in the top four right away. And and the reason you, one of the differences, like so, is Justin Schultz. And if you if Bouchard makes the team, he he, he maybe that's rushing it. But he, if they can only if they can keep him on the bottom bottom pairing, that is that's that's not rushing so much. That's a very limited role. You can really shelter a player, a defenseman, and it looks like having a forward. Your top, you know, usually when the top uh, draft picks on the orders make the forward lines, they make the first to their second line. You know, they don't make the fourth line um, too often. So this is the equivalent of that would be like a top guy being used regularly on the fourth line. So it's not asking necessarily too terribly much of him. It's a, there's a possibility that that it could be an okay idea. Um, I think the better possible, the better plan is to trade for a, a veteran right shot defenseman. But maybe that's the price is going to be too high, and maybe the difference between the the player they bring in, like just Justin Falk, and Evan Bouchard, wouldn't be that great in terms of what they're going to bring to the team. So why pay that price uh, to bring in a Justin Falk when you already have Bouchard, who's you know he's again he's he's as capable of going minus twenty five with twelve even strength points as Justin Falk is. So unless you're really certain you're going to get more than that from Justin Falk, uh, why would you make that trade and bring in all that salary? Yeah, might as well get a good look at the guy. Yeah. But there, you know, there's probably a window during which they could make a potential trade, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be day two of the regular season. It could be day 12 or day 30, right? Yeah. It's, Ethan Bear, Bruce. And uh, Ethan Bear, well. Make the team? Uh, he's hanging, looking good as, uh, as uh, number seven. Six seven. I mean, him. He and Bouchard. It's hard to pick out which is the leader, and I've, I'm now starting to see a scenario where both of them are actually on the roster for a while. Do you? Th uh, I would rather not have Bear sit as mm -hmm. a seven. I'd rather have Yarabek in that role and mm -hmm. and have Bear back on the farm playing full time. I mean, you can call him up at any moment. So if you, you if it's just as the seventh, I would I would much prefer. I don't want to see Bouchard or Bear sitting. Now right. I could see them rotating if they're both playing every second game. Mm -hmm. um for a while uh maybe right. that makes sense but not sitting yeah well you could you could also see a scenario where it's bouchard then bear in the same manner that last year it was yamamoto then pull yarvi remember they gave yamamoto yes. nine games because they had to do that first because once they sent him out he was gone and whereas uh they have so they sort of took double advantage and said, well, we'll give Pooley Yarby time in the minors. We'll give Yamamoto his taste, and then we'll make the switch. And, and you could see it coming, and, and it's exactly the way it worked out. Maybe they'll do similar. Certainly it's an option. Jason Garrison's still in camp. I, I honestly don't know why. I, I don't think he's nearly fast enough 
anymore to play at the NHL level. And Keegan Lowe was sent out, which also makes sense. Keegan Lowe, again, uh, speed and processing of the game is an issue uh, as I see it. So, do um, you want to move on to goalies, Bruce? Koskinen and, and Montoya are they the main competitors now. What should happen with both those players? Oh. Koskinen. I I heard some very encouraging stuff this afternoon on Koskinen from uh, uh, Kevin is in goal there. Uh, Kevin Woodley that yeah. does the uh, does the weekly Monday uh, goaltending segment on Gregor's show on TSN 1260, and uh, Woodley was talking about the differences between. He went into some detail on. Uh, on Costco, and it's worth a listen probably if, if you missed it, uh, talking about the differences of playing in the KHL versus the NHL. He said, one of the things I never do in the KHL is shoot into the goalie's feet from the goal line. So they do a fair bit in the NHL. And which Calgary was doing uh, to him in that first game when he was losing the puck and it looked like he didn't know where his posts were or where the puck was. I mean, it was just dreadful. He had a hell of a time. And Woodley said, even by game two last night in Winnipeg, for him, uh, he'd already made the adjustment. And those kind of pucks weren't troubling him at all. And whether Winnipeg wasn't trying it as much, but he was dealing with them. I mean, to my eye, and I said so in the game uh, review, uh, he just looked way more solid and confident, competent in the net than against Calgary. It looked like... Uh, Jonas Gustafsson, the monster, bigger version of the monster. That's yeah, unbelievable. But uh, so I I take a lot of comfort out of Woodley's um, uh, Woodley's take, and it's quite funny. Talk about how often they pass, 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 pass in the in the KHL uh, compared to NHL, more direct, get the puck to the net, right, and then go in after it. And so that now you can see where that would be an adjustment for a 30 year old goalie that had been overseas for seven years. And, and uh, so he thought that he, he actually took to the point that he said he'd be given more of the preseason time to Koskinen and give him time to adjust and just sort of settle that he's your number two and tough, tough luck for Montoya, uh, who you do know what he can do. You'd like to I completely, I completely agree. We've seen Montoya. We know what he is. He's a, he doesn't, you know, he's a proven commodity and he's a marginal backup goal in the NHL. Who's getting long on the tooth for an NHL goalie. Uh, Koskinen to me looked, looked really good in the nets. You know, maybe it was because I was expecting the worst based on what you had said and other people had said on his first game, many people oh, had said after that first game, <laughs> I thought he looked, he looked sharp. He looked, and when he's down on his knees, his shoulders up at the crossbar, mm -hmm. I mean, it's that he's in a very intriguing goalie. Now that said, I don't mind him, Bruce. If he starts, if he, if let's say they decide, they look at the schedule and they think, well, Talbot's going to play eight of the first nine games anyway, probably knowing the Oilers, it'll be nine out of nine. But um, mm -hmm. let's say they look at the schedule and, and it's like that. Well, I could see them sending him to Bakersfield for a month, getting a lot of games in, in North America, and then being called up at that point. And that might be a, a rational plan, which is no slight on Koskinen in the least, but I agree with Woodley play the guy um there, there's three games this week play him in two of them let's uh let's see if he can get even more comfortable let's see how he does yeah well yeah i mean if he goes down to bakersfield and plays a bunch of games uh, a key here is that he is um waiver exempt even though he played all three years of a of a of a entry-level contract which is usually the end of the waiver exemption for players of any skating position but for goaltenders, he's got a fourth year. And even though, uh, I mean, you look him up on Cap Friendly, and Koskinen's four years, and it's like 2009 to 2012, and then it skips all the way ahead to 2018-19 is his fourth year. But he's still exempt, even though he's 30 years old. Who knew? So they can do that, whereas if they risk Montoya on waivers and some team suffers an injury in the goal position the day he goes down, you know, that they, you know, they could be so until they're one hundred percent sure, and even if they are one hundred percent sure, if they think, you know, he needs a couple more games to sharpen up to these angles up here in North America, we don't want him doing that against Ovi and Sid. Uh, then uh, uh, it's a reasonable option, and I think it really it could, it could go either way. But I'd say sixty forty, he stays up, and will just be the guy, and they're just going to treat him like the guy. 
Alrighty, let's leave it there, Bruce. Thanks for talking this afternoon. All right, nice to catch up. Lots going on. I love this time of year, David. I love this time of year. Just so so much fun just to not, not so much try and outthink the GM and the team, it's just try and think along with them. What are they doing? Why are they doing this? What's what's next? What's the logical next step? And and uh, uh, it's uh, it's a lot happens in a short amount of time. They've made what six cuts in uh, eight days or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the big news again is the rise of Yamamoto in this whole thing, and and uh, the, the fact that he really is staking a claim. I mean, the big news is the rise of these three right wingers: Raddy, Reader, or excuse me, Raddy, Puglia, Yarvi, and Yamamoto. And it'll just be fascinating. I'm like really looking forward to the first month of the season to see how these three guys do. I think they're all going to be on the team, and uh, maybe if two out of three of them answer the question, that's absolutely huge for the Oilers, obviously. And I. And I think that that's not unlikely at this point from what, from what I've seen of the players in the past um, to expect uh, them to have pretty good results. Two out of three of them is not unreasonable, I think so. All right. Thanks again, Bruce. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.